Oh, are, are we still looking at you? Good afternoon or good morning from wherever you are trying to stream live on Facebook for this conversation. I'm glad to welcome you to this session. I am joined by four gentlemen and one lady who are going to talk about innovations that have changed in lives in maternal and infant health. So I will just be introducing, giving you opportunity to introduce yourself as well, tell us about a brief introduction about your innovation and where you are playing in your innovation and how it is impacting lives very briefly. So we start from my father. Great. Uh, my name is Chris Olson. I'm, I'm a clinician, a pediatrician, and an internist. I'm based at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I'm the director of CAMTECH, which is the Consortium for Affordable Medical Technology. What is your innovation, please? What I'll do is we'll talk about our innovation together. Maybe I'll have Dada describe what our innovation is, and I'll talk about a little bit about um, some of the exciting results we're seeing from it. Okay. Right, so the moment of birth is supposed to be a moment that brings joy to both the family and the birth attendant. And it's truly a moment that is joyful for millions of families in the world. But every year, about 1.8 million families end pregnancy in a sad situation because 1.8 million babies will die just because they are not helped to breathe at the time of birth. And our innovation is really designed to empower health workers so that they can effectively help babies breathe at the time of birth. So we developed an add-on device that goes onto every resuscitation bag that provides intuitive real-time feedback to health workers so that they know what they are doing right and what they are doing wrong so that they can fix it in that critical moment to save lives. And we have developed this, we have tested it, it's both functionally effective and it's already empowering birth attendants to do exactly what we want them to do. So maybe Chris, you can tell us the impact the innovation has had in yeah, different well, areas. What was really remarkable to us, so we performed a randomized control trial both with birth attendants in Uganda as well as at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And, and remarkably, birth attendants would achieve good ventilation and maintain it 50% longer. And then even more importantly, they would attain good ventilation in less than half of the time, in under 14 seconds. And what we know is that every 30 second delay of achieving good effective ventilation for a baby who's not breathing at birth results in 16% higher mortality every minute up to five minutes. And so we're so excited about this result and we're really now looking for scale so that we can have many more of those families that don't have a joyous day of birth actually have what they should have, which is absolute joy at the day of their delivery. Mr. John, uh, you, you're from Philips, yes. and we understand that you have a lot of innovations. Can you just give us a few and how impactful they've been? Sure. So at Philips, we believe that there's always a, a way to make life better. And to put that to the test, we've said, well, can we actually make the life better of 3 billion people in 2025? And so there are about 7 billion around that time. Um, We've also said, well, actually, there's a group of people which are most vulnerable in underserved markets which would need extra attention. So we committed this week, under every woman, every child, to improve the lives of 300 million women and children and adults in underserved areas. And we're looking at what is it really that they need. And you come up with a whole range of innovations. At the simplest level, a 3D printed pedoscope, which helps birth assistants to listen to the heart of the baby but allow the mother to listen as well. Now what happens if the mother listens to the heart of the baby? They get a, a stronger bond. You can even have the father listen in. So you're changing healthcare by a simple device like this. But a little bit more advanced, pneumonia in under five year olds is the, biggest, the second biggest killer in the world. And what, it, what you need is you need to be able to count the breathing rate of the baby. But to do that on a baby that is sick and moving is really complex. So UNICEF asked us, can you develop a tool that does that for us so we can really understand which baby is at risk and which is not? And so we're scaling that with UNICEF. At a higher level still is if we transform healthcare 
we really need to bring healthcare into the community. And we found that the most powerful way to do that is to look at the system level, put the community at the heart of, of, of whether it's the healthcare at the, at the heart of the community, and bring light, clean water, uh, professionals, uh, technology uh, to actually improve healthcare. But we've gone a little bit further. We've said women, women and children, we've asked them, what is it actually that you expect from your healthcare service in your community, apart from a safe place to, to deliver, for example? And you've come up with some really surprising answers. Some women said, well, we want a place to dance. So, okay, well, imagine that healthcare becomes that center where you develop not only healthcare, you develop economic activity, and you actually develop social engagement of the community and turn it into a life center. So that's why we have developed the community life center. And we're now rolling out community life centers across Africa, starting in Kenya, where we work with the Minister of Health, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the UN, the NGOs, and, uh, and the UN and the donors to actually bring a billion dollars worth of investment into primary care in Kenya. Okay, I'll come back to you about Kenya in a few while. Donna, tell us about the Billy Heart and what is it? What is it? So, um, my name is Donna Brzezinski, I'm a neonatologist, so I've been taking care of babies as a clinician for more than 20 years. The problem that I wish to solve is the um, lack of access to treat neonatal jaundice in low resource areas. So, neonatal jaundice is very common, it occurs in about 60% of all term newborn babies and even more so in preterm babies. And about 10% of those babies have a severe enough case of jaundice that they need treatment. The treatment that works the best when it's delivered the fastest is high intensity blue light therapy. Non-invasive, very simple, and cures nearly 100% of babies. The problem is that to deliver that treatment in downstream locations where there's unreliable electricity is virtually impossible in many regions. And in those regions, such as in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in certain areas of India, and in Southeast Asia, babies are dying from something that is virtually 100% curable. So the Billy Hut is the world's first ultra-portable, high-intensity phototherapy device that can run for a prolonged time on a battery. Right now, we have uh, two pilot tests going in Burundi. We've treated more than 120 babies. Um, many of those babies have been treated through the evening running on battery power when the electricity goes out. And the results of our pilot trial show that this is as efficacious, if not more so, than commercial devices that are currently used in developed countries. How long do the batteries go without being charged? So the, the way that we have the system set up in Burundi is that there is a power supply that is attached both to wall power and to the battery. So when the wall power is functioning, the Billy Hut runs off of that electricity. When the wall power goes out, it seamlessly switches to the battery and will continue to run on the battery until the wall power comes on again then the, it runs off the wall power and the wall power recharges the battery. So it's an, a really an endless cycle of being able to supply um, electricity to uh, get the unit to function the way it should. The longest we've run on a battery is about 12 hours and even after um, that amount of time running on a battery, it still achieves the irradiance that is necessary to treat jaundice. Mr. Carlos, uh, tell us something about the Billy metrics. Okay, then. Carlos Colasabeta. I'm Carlos Colasabeta from Billy Metrics, Italy. Um, our innovation is the Billy Stick system. We are a step back from the therapy because we are diagnosing the neonatal jaundice in the babies. This is the only method available in the market able to uh, measure with a tiny drop of blood the bilirubin concentration in the blood of the babies. So we can fastly, in a very simple way, diagnose the, the, the level of bilirubin in the, in the babies that need treatment and in this way identify the babies who need treatment. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we understand that innovation is a new thing and especially in developing countries. What are some of the challenges that you've had when you are trying to implement your innovations in those countries? Now we will start with you. Okay. So the more frequent challenges we are getting is to get involved with, with the governments because if we want to be able to get these innovations arrived to all the people in, in, in the society, we need the, the, convol the involvement of the, of the government uh, and also the, the, the training of the, of, the, of the medical staff because in this moment there are maybe other diseases, other things that uh, take more their, their attention. So the 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 the, the bilirubin and the and the gender is, is one of the less clear things in, in the in the moment. So we we are trying to this this doesn't mean that this is a problem. It's not a problem for them. 
but uh, it's something that we we are trying to to make more uh, easy and more more easy to to understand. Donna, uh, there are African countries that don't have access to electricity. Uh, yes. What are some of the solutions that you'll have to such areas? Are you thinking of solar or are you looking out to partner with other people to come up with such? So um, just with regards to the Billy Hut and how it can function, it can run off of any source that is 12 volts. So it's not limited to a car battery or a motorcycle battery. We're using that in the Burundi case because those were ubiquitous. They were already existed there and they were easy to obtain. But certainly if you had a solar charge battery or some other thing that ran, up, ran from a 12 volt source, um, the Billy Hut could run on that. Um, I did want to um, just add on to what Carlos was saying with regards to um, difficulties you have with uh, implementation. Um, whenever you bring a therapeutic into a place that's never had one before, you have to consider all of the things that need to be in place to bring that patient to therapy. And that was a, a big insight that we needed on what that context looked like, certainly in Burundi where we started. Um, understanding how to screen babies, how to get a point of care diagnostic that was quantitative for bilirubin, which is the, the pigment that we're treating with jaundice, and how to help clinicians um, understand what the treatment guidelines are were also things we had to solve. Those are the other pieces that I have here today. This is a, an icterometer that was developed by Dr. C. C. Lee at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and you simply hold it to the baby's nose and press and see how yellow the skin is. And you, a community health worker can use that way out you know, in the, in the home even and bring the babies to the nearest community health center. Use something like the Billy Metrics, Billy Sticks to provide the diagnostics. This is a clinical decision support tool that helps them decide when to treat. And then this is the final part of that pathway, the treatment. So for the first time, you're seeing the end-to-end -end management of jaundice now being capable because we've uh, developed the technologies to that point. Okay, we have more time, I'll come back to you. Felix is doing something amazing in Kenya, and you say they should watch out for Kenya. What are some of the challenges you are experiencing as you try to implement this? One minute, please. So the challenge is that if you are trying, if, if there are 6,000 clinics in Kenya um, are broken, there's no water, clean water, no electricity, no properly trained people, no good supply chain. So if you're going to transform all of that, you need leadership at the top, which we've got since this year. We need leadership from the UN, which phenomenal leadership is the charity. Some of the leadership of some of the donors, like the Global Finance Facility for Every Woman and Every Child. And then you need leadership from the industry. The private sector has a different responsibility on the SDGs, which we've taken up. So we've shown our leadership to invest. Then we need people to help the government to get engaged in long-term partnerships. That's a new role for the government. So we've had the Dutch government to help the Kenyan government to negotiate with the private sector at scale. We have provided the innovations, but you need people like the WHO to help countries select the right innovations. There are thousands of them. Which ones do we choose? And then finally, the right financial model, because there is enough money. It's just how do we use it in a country where almost 50% of healthcare is paid out of pocket? There is a way to capture all of that. And so we're working with new technologies like MTBA, which runs on the MPESA program, to actually scale this across the country. And I think we've got all the ingredients to scale it to a billion dollar in a few years. Chris, uh, what are the challenges you guys are experiencing when you're trying to spread that innovation to areas that you're working in? Yeah. I'll, Has it been easy? It, well, um, one of the things that we found is in the development of it, by really in, encouraging as a, as a design thinking methodology to get frontline birth attendants to be involved in the design process, they gave us so many practical insights that we wouldn't have necessarily thought of. Even uh, with Dr. Data being a pediatrician in Uganda, myself being a pediatrician, you wouldn't really think of them. And so they actually had a lot to say of the design, of, of the, the icons that were giving them feedback, and even to the positioning of the device. And so I think that that's really helped with, with local demand and frontline provider demand. But, but again, to agree that what we need is large partnerships where it comes from government, it comes from the private sector to, to really manufacture and distribute, and then, and then ultimately to the procurement agencies and the health facilities that will enable the end user and then 
to to obtain this equipment that that they wanted to begin with, and it really takes broad partnership. Uh, just uh, one sec, thirty uh, seconds, please. You are from Uganda. How yes. has it been? Has it been successful so far? Right. So we thirty seconds, please. We've tried all this in Uganda. As Chris said, is very successful in some of the results that we have gotten. But there's something else we, are, we have started seeing in Uganda. This device is really making an emotional connection between helping babies breathe practice and the providers. Because of the real-time feedback, we have seen that now providers are engaging in objective peer-to-peer -peer learning, which used not to be the case. So we have a tool now that is encouraging providers to be able to come together and grow their skills together. And we are really excited about that aspect. Thank you very much for joining us in this session. All the best in your future implementations. And we can't wait to see how you're going to change the world. Uh, thank you for joining us wherever you are. Good evening and good morning.